The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. And he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things of the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. You bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to be back. The heat is working. All the boilers are on fire, so we're good to go for most of the winter. We'll see what happens next week. Um, Today is Stewardship Sunday, Um, and I've got some stories and some quotes, and and maybe you've heard some of them, so we'll see what happens. Uh, I think I've told the story about when I spent time in Switzerland between bartending and seminary. I was there for four months at a Christian kind of retreat, and during that time, uh, Labrie is what the program is called. They bring in professors and theologians and people to speak once or twice a month to the group of students. And we had a gentleman come in, and he gave a great talk. I don't remember what the talk was about, so it must have been really great. Um, but we had dinner, and then really what happened was afterward, a group of four or five of us got together for tea, and we talked in the dining room for hours until 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And he told us his story. And he told us how he had spent 20 or 25 years traveling the world, seeking God, living in other religions. He was a Muslim for many years. He was a Hindu for many years. He was a pagan or a Wiccan, the occult, uh, witches and wizards and all of that. And at the end of his story of telling us about some of those adventures, he said, and at the end of it, I came to the realization what I was missing was Christianity because it was the realest of real. It was the truth. He had been raised a Christian and then thought it wasn't what it was and went on this journey to find God. And he came back in a full circle to recognize that the world, the way it is, the way we see it explained in every culture, in every race, is best explained by the gospel and the message of Jesus in the Bible that we were with God, we became sinners, God saved us, and he sets us free. This is the truth. And he found it and he said, After all that journeying, I came back to what I already knew. The truth. Which is interesting, because you've probably heard me say one of my favorite quotes multiple times. There are three types of truths. Do you remember this one? My truth, your truth, and the truth. Now, it shouldn't be this difficult, but it is. And I'm going to use a movie quote to tease out why it's difficult. Some of you have seen the movie A Few Good Men, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson, and the short of it is there's a a murder, a death in Guantanamo Bay in a marine barrack, and Colonel Jessup, Jack Nicholson, is in charge of the base, and fiery little Tom Cruise is this upstart lawyer in, in D.C. with the JAG Corps, and he has to go down and figure out what happened. Most of the movie he does, he figures out. And he thinks Jack Nicholson, the colonel, the head of the base, is responsible in one way overseeing what happened to the death of this young man. So they go to court, all sorts of shenanigans. And as it's getting to its climax, he's pushing and pushing. He calls Colonel Jessup up, Jack Nicholson on the stand, and he's pushing him. He wants to get the answer because he knows he did it. He knows he gave this, this directive to go do something to this guy. And so he's pushing him, and he's prodding him, and he's poking him. And at one point... Jack Nicholson says, you want the truth? And Tom Cruise goes, I think I des- we deserve the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, with red face, you can't handle the truth. 
And the context, he's talking about what many of us don't want to know, which is what our military has to do to keep us safe and protect us. We don't want to know. Most of us don't. Thank you. I can drive down the street and not get hit by a missile like what's happening in Israel and Ukraine and other places. Thank God. Sometimes the military has to bend rules. I'm not saying that's okay, but I don't want to know. And that's what he was saying. You can't handle it if I told you how we do it. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. What's more astounding, and many of you can remember that scene, is you can't handle the truth. We can't. The truth. If we could handle the truth, there would be 8 billion Christians, not 2. If we could handle the truth, you wouldn't have your truth and I wouldn't have my truth. There would just be the truth. We can't handle it because it's difficult. The truth is difficult. On a personal level, you all know this. My one-year-old knows this. My five-year-old knows this. Certainly the adults and teenagers in the room know this. It's hard to tell the truth. Why? We don't want to get berated. We don't want to be in trouble. We don't want to break hearts. Whatever it is, we want to get ahead, so we lie. Or we hold back the truth. And that's just speaking of generalities of the day. Not to speak of the actual truth, which is knowing and walking in the light of Jesus Christ. Because part of that begins with what? Do you remember his first words? Repent and believe. We don't like the truth. We can't handle the truth because the truth begins by noting the cross recognizes and requires that we recognize we are sinners. I don't want that. You and I can't handle the truth. You actually see this little scene where he's talking to some of his disciples. Do you remember this? Later on in one of the Gospels. I don't remember exactly where. And a couple of them are like, that was a difficult teaching. And you know what they do? They couldn't handle the truth, so they got out of the kitchen, which is one of the reasons I stopped working in restaurants. It was too hot. Can't handle the truth. We can't handle it because it hurts and it's too powerful. It's just part of the way it is. And yet, as the X-Files show would tell you, if you remember X-Files, the truth is out there. And you have been welcomed in and invited and received by the grace of God in your faith, the truth of God in Jesus Christ. So you know the truth, though it's hard to handle, you know the truth by your faith, by definition. And we hear about this truth today in our scriptures. We hear not only about the truth, but we hear about the true and living God who produces and proclaims and gives and lives in this truth. We hear today, as Paul is talking to Thessalonians, he's talking about this one and true living God. For they themselves, he says in verse 9 and 10 today, re re requ ah, sorry, report what kind of welcome you gave us and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's talking to Thessalonians. He's saying, look, you get it. There is a true God. It's not the idols. It's not those false gods. There is a true God. And that's an important place to start. Before we get to the truth, we have to know where it comes from. It comes from the true God. This is the story of the Old Testament. If you've been around church a little bit, you've heard these stories. For generation after generation, God's people walked away. Do you remember the golden calf? Thanks, God, I'm good. I'm going to create my own God over here. False gods, idols. It's the story of the Old Testament. Come back home. Come back to me. It's the story of humanity. One example from Joshua 24, 15. You'll remember the end of this verse, maybe not the beginning. Joshua 24, 15. But if it isn't pleasing in your sight to serve the Lord, the true Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord the true and living God, the one God, the real God, the truest of true gods that my friend in Labrie came home to. Everything else is false. Everything else is an idol. And Paul's saying, people recognize you know the true God. Praise God. That's awesome. But that's not the end of his sentence. You can look in your passage. That's half of the sentence. There's no period. He continues the sentence after mentioning the true and living God by saying... To serve the living and true God, 
and to await his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus our deliverer from the coming wrath. Did you see that? One sentence, one breath from the true and living God to his son who has come to save us. By definition, what has he just done? He has put the true and living God, the one God, all outside of false idols and deceptions, and he has put him in the same sentence, in the same wording as Jesus. Which should make complete sense, shouldn't it? Because Jesus is not just some random Galilean peasant rabbi man who lived 2,000 years ago. He is also God. <laughs> and it's not, don't take my word for it. Don't take Paul's word for it. We hear these very words coming out of John. John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. We put them in the same sentence because they're the same being. One God, three persons, the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God the Father is the one true living God. Jesus Christ is the one and true living God. Holy Spirit is the one and true living God. What a gift. So he says, look, you are following the true living God. And now you have followed the true and living God who has come and dwelt among you. The flesh dwelt among you. The living God has come and you have met him and talked to him and believed in him. Good job, Thessalonians. You have done that. But that's not the end of the, the story, clearly. That would be too short a sermon for you, and I don't want to surprise you. Because when we get to Matthew, you see something interesting happening. You see this divergence of the true and living God, known in God and known through Jesus, and you hear something else. Now I'm just going to put these on because it's getting hard to read. The Pharisees went out and conspired to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are honest. This word honest is aletheia. It means sincere, honest. Its true definition is true. What they have just said is, we know you are true. Interesting. That's very interesting. And that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Wait a second. Jesus is true and teaching the truth. How does that work? Somebody in here's brain just went off. I know that passage, Charlie. I know that passage. John 14. I am the way, the life, and the truth. He doesn't say that just to have fun with us. You see, the true and living God the objectivity of the reality that there is a God who created us, that we all come from that God, doesn't hang on a Christmas tree just dangling in the light. That God has become flesh and dwelt among us. By, by that definition, his power and his presence and his word has come down to earth. The true God has become a living truth. And how does he manifest that truth? In the way and the life of God. What does it mean to find the truth? What does it mean to know the truth? It means to live in the way of God. And who does that preeminently? Jesus. And by definition, those of us who walk in the way of Christ, those of us who are Christians, Christ ones, disciples of Christ, who by faith have come to know Jesus, as he says, who know the truth, now know the way to live like God because we know to live like Christ, which means we have now shared in the truth from the true and living God. I hope you're smelling what I'm cooking. This is a great gift that we have been given. We've been invited to proclaim the truth of the reality of the universe in which we live from the creator God who has created us in his image for his intentions and purposes. And when we got confused, he sent Jesus as the truth to show us what that looks like. And then he invites us to join him in that journey. The way of the living God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, we can go home. Oh, wait. There's one more thing. This interesting little passage in John chapter 8, verses 30 to 32. As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in him. Those who believe know the truth, he says. He said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word... You are my true disciples. Then you will know the truth, what we just talked about. And the truth will... Oh, 
What? The true and living God, the objective reality of everything that is and was and ever will be, which became flesh and dwelt among us, which proclaimed the truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which showed us how to live that truth, tells us that the truth will set us free? That's good news. Some of you should be going, set us free from what, Charlie? Hmm. Let's get to the marrow of today. If we are set free by the way and the truth and the life, by definition, if we are free and coming into that, it means we're leaving its opposite. So what are we freed from, my brothers and sisters? Well, what's the opposite of those things? The opposite of truth is lies and deceptions and falsehood. The opposite of a way that you can see and walk is brokenness and lostness. The opposite of life is (coughs) death and sin. So the objective reality, the truth of the universe in which we exist beyond all other truths becomes flesh to proclaim the truth and show us the example of the truth so that we could be set free from lies, deceptions, falsehood, brokenness, lostness, sin, and death. So that in that relationship with Jesus, we enter the opposite, the way and the truth and the life of God. We, by definition, are no longer pilot. We are no longer a part of the world. We've been set aside for something different. Why do I say pilot? Do you remember the scene? Have you seen the Passion of the Christ? It's a powerful moment. It's in other scenes. You can read it in the scriptures, of course. He's having his discussion with Jesus. He's getting a little frustrated. Pilate is. And do you remember what he says to him in John's Gospel near the end? What is truth? Irony of all ironies. Who is he speaking to? The true and living God who has dwelt among us as flesh, who is the truth and the living way of God. He's literally speaking to truth and asking what truth is. Don't ever miss the irony of that moment. Because the blindness and the deafness of Pilate is literally an emblematic system in which we live in the world. The world is blind to Christ, deaf to Christ, doesn't want to know Christ because the truth is hard because we can't handle the truth. And so we run and hide. We disavow it. We seek other religions, other faiths, other idols. And those are all the things that we make our gods, not just the gods of other religions that aren't part of the truth. This is the world we live in. And if by definition, in our faith, we are walking the way and the truth and the life, It means by definition that the world of Pilate and the world outside of our faith is doing what then? They are living in a world overwhelmed by all the opposites of that. We're part of that world. We have our own actions in it. We do have forgiveness and repentance, praise God. But we all know those, don't we? The lies, the deceptions, the falsehoods, the brokenness the lostness, the oppressiveness, the death, and the sin. Every one of us knows it. Everyone has seen it in your own lives, in your family, the people at the line at Stop and Shop who are cantankerous and don't have any patience, the people who are really bad drivers from New York. None of you, though. We see it in our media on all sides, let's be fair. We see it in our social media. Holy God, get our children out of that. We see it in Ukraine. We see it in Israel, the Holy Land itself. We see this brokenness and the deception and the falsehood. We see the sin and the death. Into that world came the truth. Are you hungry for it? Are you thirsty for it? Because by your faith, you have deemed it receptive to you. You have already received the truth. You know the way and the life of God in Christ. And by definition, does that solve your problems? No, it has begun the process of hope and salvation and forgiveness and love and mercy and all the wonderful things that come along with it. It's the perfection of kingdom of God when we go home to meet him face to face. But if you know that hunger and you know that thirst, can you imagine the people who don't? 
who don't know that there's an answer, don't know there's a truth, the truth, who are hungry and thirsty. This world is very hungry, very thirsty. So when it comes to stewardship season, I could, as I have in past and as I've written in your packets, which you'll receive in a moment, I could tell you about the things we need. Clearly, you like electricity. Most of you like winter heat, right? We can talk about all those things. I can share a personal story of why I give. You've shared personal stories. There's a letter from an anonymous person from the parish who has shared one of their stories. We could do that. But in the midst of what's going on in this world right now, what I suggest to you, what I offer to you is, is there a greater purpose to give to, to pledge to, To tithe, dare I suggest that 10% tithe from the Bible? Is there a greater cause than bringing truth into the world? From my standpoint, my experience in 47 years in life on this planet, no, there is not. Because it is from the truth where everything else grows, everything else prospers, where we can overcome sin and death, where we know truth against falsehood, where we know the true God against the deceptive idols. And our stewardship season, which for those of you who are visiting for the first time, we only do it once a year because this is a hard thing to do every week. Not to mention you wouldn't come back if I did it every week. Today I ask you to consider that. That at the core of what we do is we present and proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ to the world who is hungry and thirsty for truth in a world filled with falsehoods and deceptions and sin and death and brokenness and lostness. And following the way of the living God, the true and living God, that truth is the beginning of that healing and that following and that way and that life. And when you give both your time and your love, and especially when you dig into those pocketbooks and those 401ks and whatever else it is, your gold stash, we take gold. When you do that, you're not just giving for this or giving to pay me or doing that. You are literally magnifying and multiplying the work of proclaiming the truth to a world that is so hungry and thirsty for it, I can't even explain it. That's what stewardship is about. We should be so grateful, praising God, that we are no longer hungry and thirsty, at least not fully. It's almost lunchtime. We should be giving praise and thanks and opening up our hearts, our minds, our pocketbooks and saying, Lord, take this And show the world your truth. Boy, does it need it. So this stewardship season, I encourage each and every one of you to give deeply of yourself and recognize that what you are actually doing is helping God through Christ and the power of the Spirit to proclaim the truth that the world can't handle, doesn't know, has forgotten, and needs so desperately. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.